It was 2008. Chris Dancy was 39 years old, working for a software company in Salt Lake City, Utah. And his health was not great. I weighed 320 pounds. I smoked two packs of Marble Light 100s a day, sometimes three. I drank about 24 to 36 cans of Diet Coke a day. What? Yep. Was there a Costco near you or something? I mean, I would just go to 7-Eleven because you could get cigarettes and Diet Coke at the same time. I mean, I would spend garish amounts of money on alcohol. So on the weekends, I would just be drunk from, you know, Thursday afternoon to Monday. And then, you know, all sorts of recreational street drugs. I mean, 2008 was like the bottom of the bottom for me. It was really, really ugly. And then the bottom of the bottom of the bottom came after Chris partied all night long with a group of friends. He blacked out, which wasn't necessarily that unusual in those days. But when he woke up and looked at Facebook, he saw a photo. In the photo, he's sitting on his porch, hunched over. He looks pretty wasted. He's got a cigarette in one hand and a beer bottle beside him. His belly obscures a lot of his body. And he's naked except for a pink cowboy hat. It was time to make a change. I'm Christina Quinn, and this is Dot Future, a branded podcast from Microsoft and Gimlet Creative about making the future happen. And the reason we're starting in the past on a show about the future is because Chris had a choice to make. The future doesn't just happen, It's the result of a series of choices that we're making right now. You can wait for the future to come to you, or you can engage with it and get ahead of the curve. Welcome to Dot Future. Today we're talking about health, and specifically about how we approach it in the digital age. There are new tools to consider for tracking and measuring our health, and then there are new ideas to consider, ways to look at the information we're already generating with our behavior or bodies that help us understand our well-being. So back to Chris, our naked cowboy. I'm kidding. We're not going to call him that. I personally like Mindful Cyborg. Mindful Cyborg. The reason he calls himself this is because he is so plugged in. Chris uses over 700 sensors and devices to track himself. Devices that produce data that Chris credits with radically changing his life. And data that's brought him a kind of notoriety in certain circles. Chris travels the world talking about being connected because he believes we're facing a turning point in how we think about the data we collect about ourselves. And Chris collects a lot of data. He's got on three wearables on the same wrist all at the same time. And that doesn't count the various sensors and smart devices scattered throughout his house. More on that later. After he hit bottom in 2008, Chris decided to do something about his health. So to solve the problem in front of him, he turned to his tech background. He created a dashboard. Chris took inspiration from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, shelter, water, food. And he made his own list. So in addition to tracking his health, he started tracking his finances, how much he was socializing, and even his spirituality. It was all color-coded so he could tell which areas of his life he was doing well in and which were being neglected. He started measuring everything he could think of that related to the list. Things happening inside of him and around him. What's your heart rate? What's your respiration? What's your blood sugar? How hot is it? What's the humidity? How bright is it? How loud is it? He took that information and he used it. Because I keep track of a lot of sets of data about myself, it's very easy for me to understand where behaviors are coming from and how to adjust them. And now, when you visit Chris at his house, it's not piles of Diet Coke cans that you're stepping over. It's cords. You ready for, like, uh, the Willy Wonka of cyborgs? Yes. He gave us a tour of his home in Nashville. So in here... Dun, dun, dun. So I've got five, six, one, two, three, four, five shelves full of uh, technology. Chris's closet is like a museum of wearables past. It's got smartwatch prototypes, headbands that measure brainwaves, and even lasers that help him measure the environment around him. Most of this tech is obsolete now. He's keeping it as memorabilia, but he still uses some of it. This is awesome. 
this little pill here. What that does is it's got a sensor inside it and you swallow it and it measures things that goes through your body. And then in here, next to my bed, so some people have books in their <laughs> bookshelf. I actually have um, hundreds and hundreds of chargers. If I need to recharge, I can just do it right next to my bed. Every sensor and wire is here to help Chris get information and use it to adjust his behavior or environment, to subtly coax him into living his best life. Besides weight and heart rate, he checks his blood oxygen levels, calorie intake, and monitors his sleeping habits. He tracks how much music he listens to, which apps he's using the most on his phone, even how much light he's exposed to. For most of us, this isn't normal behavior. It's extreme. For Chris, it's helped him gain control over his life. This data lets him make sophisticated connections about his health. So, for example, he learned that when he's eating in a noisy room, he tends to eat more quickly. And eating quickly makes him feel hungry again sooner. His environment affects how he feels, sometimes negatively, but also positively. And his analysis can help him optimize his environment to help him live a better life. The other thing that happens is I have aromatherapies in my house, little diffusers that are plugged into the wall that are on Wemo switches. They release scents in that same time frame to, to slowly start getting me ready for bed. So think of it as a, no a soft notification. At night, you know, around 9.30, my phone does this little lullaby sound like ding, ding, ding. So it's all about kind of getting me ready for bed. Having all of this data has helped Chris come up with a bunch of solutions, but it's also created new questions and caused some hiccups. In the beginning, I signed up for like big data services, like this thing called Flu Near You. And like, I'd call my doctor and say, you know, the flu's a block away, I, I have it. And he was like, why do you say that? Do you have any symptoms? I'm like, no, but I can tell it's coming. I've got the data to prove it. His doctor felt like Chris's data was second guessing his medical training. And so... I was fired. I was fired from my first doctor. He told me after almost 20 years of being my doctor, he didn't want to see me anymore. Chris found a new doctor who wasn't afraid to take on him and his data. But he's also a little more sympathetic now to the challenges that he can present to doctors. He tells me all the time that he gets quote unquote Fitbitted. So his patients come in with their weaponized Fitbit data and say, give me Ambien, look at this. Or, you know, I need fat pills, look at this. I always tell people I wasn't wrong, I was just early. Chris has decided that he's not going to let any of that data around him go to waste. He's going to collect every last bit and use it to optimize his life. There are lots of people like Chris. This is a movement. It's called the Quantified Self, and it includes a range of folks, from people who track their steps every day to people who measure themselves to the nth degree, like Chris. The term quantified self was coined by journalist Gary Wolf. To know thyself functioned both as a, a mandate and also a warning. This is Gary. He's been working in the quantified self movement for over 10 years and organizes meetups around the world where people come together to discuss experiences, tools, and methods in what's often called life logging. Gary's a big advocate for folks who collect data about themselves and then create and test hypotheses. He believes that people like Chris Dancy could eventually produce scientific knowledge that benefits everyone. If only there was a way to share and discuss their results. Where, for instance, do those discoveries get published and how do they get disseminated? Not everybody who makes those discoveries is going to be a PhD or an MD or aspire to publish in an academic journal. That doesn't mean that their discoveries don't need to be shared. And then there's the flip side. Maybe someone thinks they've discovered something cool and they start telling everyone to change their behavior. But it's just based on the study of one single person doing a self-experiment. We all benefit from having other people see our work and having it critically read. So not only are there new tools, there are new people, and the new tools and the new people together require a new infrastructure for making medical knowledge. Ultimately, the sample sizes of the experiments run by life loggers like Chris Dancy are too small to mean much. But Chris is onto something. For decades, scientists have been sampling the environment to monitor the spread of diseases in their carriers. It's an idea that's most powerful when you're looking at data in the aggregate. You know, a bunch of small pieces of information that reveal a pattern when you look at them together. You've heard of this. It's called big data. 
Yeah, so I'm Ethan Jackson. I'm a lead researcher at Microsoft. I lead Project Premonition. Project Premonition. The name sounds kind of spooky, but what Ethan's team is doing is trying to level up the way we detect epidemics. Because right now, the process is kind of slow. Today, we detect epidemics after they've started, when people are starting to show up at the hospital. And that detection is typically too far along in the epidemic to really stop it, um, particularly for diseases we haven't seen before. Uh, you know, developing a vaccine typically takes years. Even if we have a vaccine or some treatment that may work, deploying it to enough people is very difficult to do once it's already been detected in the hospital. So Ethan's team is using tools like cloud computing, machine learning, and robots to track pathogens before they start showing up in people. Because diseases that turn into epidemics don't come out of thin air. 60 to 75 percent of emerging diseases are caused by pathogens found in animals. So to find out what diseases humans might get, you need to find out what diseases animals already have. And the best way to do that? With blood. But researchers can't practically run around drawing blood from every woodland creature. Luckily, nature is already doing that. Nature invented the mosquito. It's incredibly effective at sneaking around in the middle of the night, finding an animal, taking a blood sample, and escaping. So we start to ask the question, could we use mosquitoes as devices, as part of the system that would go out into the environment and bring us back blood samples from animals that are hiding? As you may well know, mosquitoes regularly draw blood. In fact, they're one of the big ways that pathogens make their way from animals to humans. So if you can test the blood that mosquitoes bring back and figure out where the mosquitoes were, you can determine what pathogens are in the environment. But standard mosquito traps aren't great. They trap all sorts of bugs that scientists don't need. So Ethan's team went to the jungles of Granada to learn how to build a better mosquito trap. You basically have this big bag of bugs. It has all sorts of things, a small percentage of which are mosquitoes. And that's one of the challenge in monitoring mosquitoes today is that you have a very complex mixture of insects that could potentially appear, and you need actually a, a very skilled person to separate out the specimens that are interesting and the specimens that aren't interesting. That's really labor-intensive. And moving the traps to where the more interesting mosquitoes are is also labor-intensive. Project Premonition is trying to build a smarter trap. With the help of a drone, the plan is to fly the smart trap to where mosquitoes are most likely to hang out. In the future, Ethan hopes the smart trap and drone will become one. It's a sort of robotic field biologist that understands the insects that are flying around it, in real time can tell them apart and make a decision about whether it wants to capture a specific insect or ignore one. Ethan says there's been an inflection point in epidemic research. Three technologies are radically improving our ability to predict what pathogens will jump from animals to humans. The first. There's been an explosion of systems that can go in the environment and collect new data sets. The second technology is gene sequencing. So being able to extract genetic material from a biological sample, like a mosquito, and then turning it into digital data. That process is much faster and cheaper than it used to be. And the third. The third, of course, is cloud computing and machine learning, which allows us to take very large data sets and then reason about them in very complicated ways. I think when you put those three trends together, it points towards better technologies to try to address a very complicated problem, which is predicting the movement of potential pathogens in space and time before they cause outbreaks in people. The hope is that someday systems, like Project Premonition, will be able to collect and analyze enough data from the environment so they can predict an outbreak, like a weather forecast, but for human diseases. If the temperature is like this and the humidity is like that and you're in this location, then you really have a high risk of possibly encountering a mosquito uh, that might be dangerous. If you want to think about it like a map that changes in space and time, like a weather forecast, something that lets you wrap your head around what's going on uh, in the environment at a much larger scale. Ethan's team is using big data to analyze biological information. But for some people, there can be a big gap between what we know about our bodies and what we want to know. That applies in particular to people looking to start families. For many of us, fertility is still a black box. One woman is trying to change that. 
if I found out how if I had a lower number of eggs than I should for my age group and ethnicity, maybe I would spend more time improving my dating profile. This is Reedy Tariel, and the reason she's talking about her dating profile is because of how many eggs she has. Her fertility was the genesis of her company. She's the CEO of Next Gen Jane, a company that's developing a way to help women track their own health and fertility without going to a doctor or a clinic. Reedy is an example of someone who's hoping to use data to be proactive about health, to get information to help people plan and manage their lives, rather than just responding to health crises. Reedy was 33 years old, single with no children, and wanted to know how much time she had left to have kids. Did she really have to spruce up her dating profile? But when she went to her doctor with that question, the fertility one, not the dating one, the answer was disappointing. I thought this would be an easy conversation, and I asked her if there was some way I could help sort of mitigate my fears about how much longer I had to have kids, and she said she didn't know of anything. Reedy couldn't believe that was really true, so she went home and did some research. She found out there is a test that measures what's called the anti-malarian hormone, also known as AMH. Low AMH levels could indicate that a woman's fertility is declining faster than average. So Reedy went back to her doctor to ask for the test. Her response was, I can't prescribe that test to you until you've proven to me that you actually are infertile, meaning you have to go and try to have a child for a year and be unable to do so, and then we'll say you're infertile, and then insurance will start paying for your testing. Her doctor wouldn't do the test. She could get the test at a fertility clinic, but that was expensive too. And just on principle, it seemed weird to not be able to access information that was already in her body. It was frustrating, but also... It was perfect. Reedy has a degree in biomedical enterprise, basically an MBA degree that allows students to focus on biomedical problems. And she was looking for a business problem to solve. This was it. Helping other women be more proactive about getting their data could be the foundation of a business. She just needed to figure out a way to make AMH readings easily accessible to women. To do all of that, first she would need blood. There were moments where I had band-aids on every finger because when we were trying to prove out whether or not you could use finger stick blood instead of venous blood, um, we needed a certain quantity of blood and and I couldn't get it with one finger stick, so I would poke myself 10 to 12 times. Venous blood is the blood from inside your veins, and getting it at home isn't feasible for most people. So Reedy mulled it over and realized there already was a way to get a large volume of blood every month. It occurred to Reedy that what she needed was a smart tampon, or rather just a normal tampon and a smart process to test menstrual blood for AMH. She would take something routine, like a period, and then turn it into a way to gather information. Reedy had solved the research problem, she had solved the blood problem, but there was one more problem. The icky problem. I called a really prominent lab who shall remain unnamed. We told them what we were doing, and we told them we're using a tampon to do it. And they basically said, you should stop now um, because no lab in America would ever touch a dirty tampon. Again, it was so frustrating. The data was right there, but she couldn't get to it. We probably spent a, a, a night reveling in anger and then, you know, got up and said, cool. It's great if nobody else wants to do it. From a business perspective, we'd love that monopoly. Next Gen Jane is about to do a third clinical trial of the smart tampon testing system. Reedy's goal is to have the technology refined and available by 2021. She's hoping to raise at least $50 million to bring the product to market. $50 million! It seems kind of insane at first, but not when you consider that fertility is a huge factor for people who want families. As an individual woman, it's really helpful in helping to lower my anxiety. Um, And I think that over time, there's going to be a need for women in general to become much more active agents in making these these trade-offs and decisions about fertility. Reedy's part of a movement of engineers and designers trying to unlock information that can help people not just have better health, but better lives. This mommy tax that women pay, a lot of social scientists, that when they break it down, the difference in gender pay actually comes down to the type of jobs women are choosing. 
as well as the ability to have temporal flexibility in these jobs, um, which both of these decisions are driven by the fact that they are the primary caretakers of both their children and their parents, and so they need more flexible hours and less demanding jobs. Having more precise data about your fertility before you ever want to have children means more control. It means being able to predict exactly when you'll need more flexibility in your job. In the aggregate, giving women access to this kind of data and planning could help get rid of that mommy tax and the pay disparity across gender. Ending the wage gap is a lot to expect from a tampon, but it's steps like these that get us closer to escaping what Ziad Sankari calls the dark ages of data in medicine. This is a true concern, helping people know what's not otherwise easily decipherable from their bodies. Ziad is the founder of Cardio Diagnostics. The company makes software that allows doctors to monitor a patient's cardiac data in real time, remotely, because cardiac events tend to strike suddenly without warning. With cardio diagnostics, people can get similar monitoring to what they'd get in a hospital without having to be in a hospital. Folks can go about their day, meet friends, play tennis, all under the watchful eye of remote medical personnel and advanced algorithms. The company works in conjunction with doctors because their medical knowledge is really important for interpreting data. But Ziad's also hoping for a time in the near future when we're all a little better at interpreting our own data. Ziad compares our current relationship with data to the Dark Ages, when the Bible was locked up in a language that only certain people could access, Latin. In the Middle Ages, it was very difficult for people to read Latin, so people needed the help of uh, priests to understand what God said in the Bible. And I see that we have a comparable scenario nowadays. Where we now may be akin to the moment when people said, hey, we want that information. We want to read the Bible for ourselves. Medicine is extremely difficult and only few people can read the data and it's typically physicians and providers. We want to be able to use technology to make it easier for people to learn how to read the data and how to manage themselves easier and more efficiently. And once you do that, that's the true revolution in technology and healthcare. Because once you're empowered, you can make changes, big changes. Dot Future is a co-production of Microsoft Story Labs and Gimlet Creative. We were produced this week by Garrett Crow and Caitlin Boguki, with help from Victoria Barner, Francis Harlow, Nicole Wong, Abby Ruzica, Julia Botero, and Jorge Estrada. Creative direction from Nazanin Rasunjani. Production assistance from Kimberly Green, Ben Kubrick, and Tom Cody. We were edited by Rachel Ward. Sound design and mix by Zach Schmidt. Our theme song was composed by The Album Leaf. Music from Waltho, Lullatone, and Marmoset. Special thanks to Mark Drangsholt and Deborah Lupton. Coming up next on Dot Future. Previously, you know, the marketing guys at whatever big publishing company would have been like, excuse me, no one's going to buy that. It's, it's a couple of teen lesbians, you're on crack. We're going where video games haven't gone before. The tiny indie games that are challenging the status quo in the industry. If you like Dot Future, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And hey, do us a favor. If you're into the stories you hear on Dot Future, leave us a review so we know what we're doing right. And so more people can join us in the future. Dot thanks. To learn more about the show, go to dotfuture.net. That's dotfuture.net. I'm Christina Quinn. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>